All right, we are recording. Let's get rolling. Week eight, we are going to wrap it up nicely and put a little bow on everything you've learned um, over the last eight weeks, seven weeks. We're also going to watch a, a one really great video on how to check for understanding. Very clear, something I use with my teachers every single year. It's a great refresher. Um, and it might be new for some of you as well. So it'll be good for you to uh, access. And then we're going to do a little bit of teacher interview questions practice, which even if you've got a job, will be good just for you to reflect on and think about. Um, and finally, there's one more video that I end all my classes with. And it's uh, just meant to show you the impact that you're going to have as a teacher. So anyway, um, let's go ahead and get rolling. I hope everybody's doing well tonight. It has been a fast term. There's no doubt about that. So what did we learn over the last seven weeks? First, we talked about brain development, how it impacts classroom instruction, right? So what did we really, when we dove into that week one content, we learned that kids have to feel safe and loved before they learn. I heard the best quote um, the other day at a conference that you have to Maslow before you bloom. And uh, you think about the research, right? You think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, and Bloom's taxonomy, right? So Maslow's hierarchy is all about safety, security, and, and meeting those, that self-actualization pinnacle. And then Bloom's taxonomy is talking about the different levels of learning. And she said, the, the speaker said, Students have to Maslow before they bloom. And I just, something that's gonna be locked into my brain because I loved it. Um, so yeah, kids have to feel safe, then loved, and then they learn. Um, we know that emotions are the gatekeeper to learning. Experiences are uh, important. So when, you, when you're standing up and lecturing in front of the classroom, remember that a lot of your kids probably aren't gonna retain that information because their synapses aren't firing and they're not connecting because um, it's not an emotional experience or an experience at all. So you have to appeal to the senses. Next, we talked about differentiation and student engagement. We talked about blended learning. We went over that model, the station rotation model of blended learning. Talked about how important it is to meet the needs of all students in your classroom through student engagement, checking for understanding, which we're gonna watch a quick video on tonight. Um, just because it's so important and I want you guys, I want that to really be driven home. And we talked about the idea of every student, every question, every time, not having students raise their hands and volunteering answers because when we allow students to volunteer for, for answering, we send the message that learning is voluntary. And I, I really appreciated reading in many of your um, signature assignments, your reflections, how you noticed when teachers did that. And I think you had a different lens of looking at that kind of instruction and seeing that a number of students were disengaged or that the teacher, even against probably if you were to ask them, do you call on every student equally? They'd probably say yes, but you notice that they call on the same kids over and over again. So yeah, that's, a, that's an important one, student engagement differentiation. Uh, Teacher-centered instruction, week three. This is one of my favorite ones to teach. We talked about the direct instru instruction lesson plan. Hopefully you've saved that, um, that lesson plan that I gave you, the long form. Um, use that to, to create lesson plans. I can't encourage you enough. As, as hard and as monotonous or time-consuming as it might be, try to master the idea of planning out every single one of your lessons using that form, okay? Just, just to think about it. It'll take a, a couple of years of doing that and try to deliver instruction in that sequence to the point where it becomes natural and that's the way you teach. You will be a better teacher and your students will learn so much more if you do that. So please, please, please um, try to use that plan to sequence your instruction and plan for, for teaching. We talked about student-centered instruction, everybody's favorite. When we got into project-based learning, got into Socratic seminar, we talked a little bit about performance tasks and how important it is that students learn hands-on. Student, We think about moving students from the concrete to the abstract, right? So that's what we wanna do from concrete teacher-centered instruction to abstract student-centered learning. 
Then we talked about in week uh, five strategies that promote higher level thinking or higher order thinking. This is when we talked about depth of knowledge. We talked about Bloom's taxonomy and we talked about the SAMR model of technology integration. So we know that Bloom's are six levels of Bloom's. There's four levels in DOK and then SAMR has a, it's like a ladder moving upwards, right? Substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition. Right, moving um, from enhanced learning to redefining learning, right? So that's what we're shooting for when we're integrating technology. And then that DOK piece, we, we used the, uh, the bird, the differentiator, which was, you know, time consuming, but wanted to drive the, the point home that when you're writing an objective, just by changing the verb or your outcome, you can raise the rigor or the higher level thinking um, the thinking level of your lessons just by changing a few things in your objective. Um, so hopefully you grabbed on to that. Uh, week six, we talked about assessment. We talked about how data is the voice of the student. That we don't just assess to assess. We talked about the differences between formative and summative assessments. We talked about the importance of diagnostic assessments. We talked about formative assessments as being like a physical and summative assessments being like an autopsy and that we have to use the data, that there's no such thing as good data or bad data. It just is data, right? And it's what you do with it that makes all the difference. If you're just assessing kids and you're doing nothing with the data, if you're not um, informing instruction or changing your lesson plans or differentiating groups or whatever you're gonna do with that data, then it is, it's useless. Then don't even bother assessing kids. Uh, make sure that you're doing something constructive with the data that's meant to raise student achievement. Last week, we talked about grading and reporting. One sec, let me mute. Okay. Uh, we talked about grading and reporting. We talked about the different types of grades we give uh, from norm referenced, standards based grades. We talked about rubrics and portfolios. We got into the discussion on whether homework should be graded, making sure that you have documentation to support the grades that you have. That's why rubrics are so important. Um, we talked about the importance of meeting with parents and, and the information that we give parents and how you want to, um, hold on, I have it, make sure grades are not weapons, but also paying into your parents before you make withdrawals. Remember looking at them as an ATM machine. You wanna, uh, before you have a conference with them, give them lots of good positive feedback on their students. A lot of parents, believe it or not, um, they, they care less about the student's grades than they do about whether or not you like their child. So you got to send the message, whether you really do or not, you got to send the message that you do like their child or else you're going to have problems. It'll be a really long 180 days for you. And it helps if you actually do like their child. So, wow, that's a lot of stuff we covered in eight weeks. Would you agree? All right. So we're gonna watch a quick video on checking for understanding. This is a very rudimentary, basic video, but I love, this video has been around for a while. It's from um, EDI, um, or not EDI, uh, DataWorks. And DataWorks is a great firm that does a lot of research on best practices across the country in education. And they give a little bit of background on what it, how to check for understanding effectively using the TAPL method. Here we go. Hello, I'm John Hollingsworth from DataWorks Educational Research. Today we're going to talk about checking for understanding using TAPL. And these strategies come out of our book, Explicit Direct Instruction, The Power of the Well-Crafted, Well-Taught Lesson. And our new follow-up book, Explicit Direct Instruction for English Learners. It's also the basis of all our trainings from DataWorks. But before we start talking about checking for understanding, let's look at the definition of checking for understanding. I've got the definition right up here on the screen. Let's read it together. What's it say? Checking for understanding is continually verifying students are learning what is being taught while it's being taught. So what that means is you stop every two minutes or every couple of minutes, not exactly two minutes, but make sure they're learning while you're teaching. Now checking for understanding is not looking at the quizzes or the homework or the test scores to see if students learned. It's actually checking in real time what you teach every day. 
Now let's look at the steps for TAPL. The T is the first step. The T stands for teach first before you ask the questions. Don't start asking questions before you're taught. And that provides equal opportunity. Every child can answer. Avoid these type of questions, who knows or what is this. The job is for you as the teachers, what? Teach first and then make sure the students are learning just what you're teaching. Read with me. Solve two-step equations. There's four steps to doing this. Number one, read the problem. What is the value of x in the two-step equation? All right, I want to find x. Number two, isolate the term with the variable. All right, isolate means separate. So when I say isolate, you say separate. Separate. Isolate. Isolate. Separate. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to isolate or separate this term, separate it from the other stuff. Circle x divided by 2. We're going to do the other operation first. So once I've circled x divided by 2, I know my first inverse operation is to get rid of minus 3. I add 3 to both sides. So now I've isolated my variable and I have plus 3 minus 2, I have 1. Let's look at the A in TAPL. Ask a specific question about what you just taught. No opinions. Now specific might mean students, how did I solve this problem? Or it could be students, how did you just solve this problem? And of course you could ask concept based question, what does the answer mean? Tell me in your own words what the definition is. Avoid these type of questions. Does everybody understand? Do you know how to solve it? Those type of questions are opinion problems and most students won't self-identify. Let's look at the next step for TAPL, the first P. Pause, pair, share, and point. So pause, there's a little research right here below it. Three to five seconds is actually the research for humans to think of an answer. It takes a few seconds for your brain to process the question. The eight to 10 over here is actually the research for English learners. English learners take a little bit longer. Actually what they're doing quite often, they're translating the question into the home language, answering the home language, and then translate it back. If you don't provide enough wait time, not all the students are actually processing information and thinking about it. Now a super practice for checking for understanding is the pair share. What we do now is every question, let me say that again, every question you ask, have the students turn to their partners and answer the questions with each other. It's best to have partners, A partners and B partners. You can use different labels if you want. But you have the two partners and you direct the partners. A partners explain to Bs. Bs explain. As go first. This way with a pair share, everybody's answering every question. Make sure that you're having a pair share using complete sentences with academic language. You don't want the student to say six. You want a complete sentence such as, the perimeter of the polygon is six inches. And you get this by cueing the students. Just this week I taught a high school lesson. I had the students answer, the character trait in the dramatic monologue was, and then they had to explain the character trait. And that's using what, the new vocabulary from the lesson. The last one up here, the point, this is a great practice. If kids are parasharing and have papers in front of them, you can say, I want the A partners to point to the paper, to B's paper, to partner B's paper, and explain how to solve that problem. Or A's, point to the paragraph in B's book and show them where the character traits are being revealed. Or what? Take your whiteboard and explain every number you solve on your whiteboard. The point has that kinesthetic activity where the kids are actually pointing and moving, and the one that pointing the partners is the best one. So B's talk to A's. What did I do to isolate this variable? A's talk to B's. And let's look at the next part of TAPL, the second P. Let's read together. Pick a non-volunteer to measure if everyone is learning. So the next step is you've asked the question, the students have pair shared, they've rehearsed their answer, they're ready. Well, this is a great rehearsal. The pair share is great for English learners because what they're practicing oral language while they pair share. Now, you always pick a non-volunteer. Make sure you don't call hand waivers. If you have hand waivers, usually what I see is the same two or three kids answering the whole lesson. With a non-volunteer, all the students are going to participate. So make sure you do non-volunteers. Usually that's popsicle sticks, three by five cards, or some mechanical system of calling non-volunteers. I will have to say I've taught quite a few high school lessons lately. Started calling the students, said, oh, you mean I have to answer the question? Do you want me to answer? I said, yeah, I want everyone to participate. And also, if you're checking for understanding, you're doing a little polling, you have to call non-volunteers or your poll is not accurate. If you just call three volunteers, usually those are the three students who probably know the answers, who may know it already. 
Brooke, Rebus. How did I isolate the variable? You isolated the variable by doing the inverse operation. Very good. What was that inverse operation? The inverse operation was addition. Let's look at the next part of TAPL. L, listen to the response to make an instructional decision. Every time students answer, you need to make a decision. Are they with me? Do I need to reteach? What do I need to do? And let's look at the E. Here's our kind of our three choices. There's our three simple choices for feedback, effective feedback, echo if correct, elaborate if tentative, explain if incorrect. Echo if it's correct, sometimes just repeating the answer helps other kids hear the answer, kind of affirms to the students who reply that he has the correct answer. You isolated the variable by doing the inverse operation. Very good. What was that inverse operation? The inverse operation was addition. Addition. I added three to both sides. That's how I isolate the variable. You do the opposite. The second E for effective feedback, elaborate. What you can do is just elaborate. If the student's answer is a little tentative, you can just, what, rephrase it and actually make it sound a little bit better. You don't need to reteach. Michelle? You isolated the variable by adding... Yes, and what did I add? Three. I added three to both sides to keep it balanced, right? That's how I isolated the variable. Very good. This last one, though, is super important. Explain if incorrect. If you have taken notes, write a little two up there. If two students in a row can't answer, reteach. Don't fish for the answer. In other words, don't start just calling students till you find someone who knows. Just stop and reteach. All right, I think we've covered all the steps of TAPL. Let's quickly go over them again. Teach first before you ask the question. Every child is prepared to answer. Ask a specific question. Don't ask opinion questions like, do you understand? Ask a real question, a content-based question. Pause, pair, share, and point. Let's just look at the pair share. Pair share takes care of the pause. You give, what, sometimes 30 or 40 seconds while the students explain their answers. They've had plenty of time to prepare. Pick a non-volunteer, have sticks, um, three by five cards, some method of randomization, pick a non-volunteer. Listen to the response and provide effective feedback. You want to echo the responses, the cue and prompt, elaborate a little bit till everyone knows. Or we'll just reteach if necessary. Do one more, if you look very carefully, you see where it says ask a question? It's before you pick the non-volunteer, so you should be asking a question. Students, how did I solve this problem? Explain to your neighbors, and in a minute, I'm going to ask one of you. If you call the name first, okay, uh, John, I'm going to, can you answer this question? You've called the name first, that person is thinking, and the rest of the class is just looking over. They actually stop thinking. So make sure you do this. Ask the question first. Let everybody think about it and discuss it and then pick the non-volunteer. So I think we've covered all of it. I'm John Hollingsworth from DadWorks. We covered TAPL, Checking for Understanding, developed by DadWorks Educational Research. Much of it comes out of our book, Explicit Directive. All right, what did you think? Instruction and our new book. What did you think? Let's discuss for a little bit. TAPL. How many of you are familiar with TAPL? besides in this class. Anybody? Is my mic working? Okay, good. Okay, good. Good, how many of you in the classroom have been trying to use this approach to checking for understanding? <laughs> Good. What, what do you find is most successful as you've tried to use it, and what are you struggling with the most? One thing I notice a lot of my teachers struggle with is probably not calling, or when they call a student and then ask the question, even if they're using popsicle sticks or whatever it might be. Um, a lot of times they'll they'll call on the student that asks the question and just have to gently remind them that when you do that um, the only person listening is the kid you called so oh is yeah Kevin absolutely I think about that think time right because you think about what your ELs are doing are they're translating it twice right one into their language to think about and then one back into English to answer and it's it, we have to give them time to do that oh yeah hand raisers can't stand tapple. <laughs> so how, let's let's talk about that because you don't want them to be frustrated, right? You don't want to squash your eager learners. So what can you do to to meet their needs as well? 
without having them take all the air out, out of the classroom. Absolutely, let them, you know, did you have anything you'd like to add to anybody's um, answer? Good, Susan, that's a good strategy too. Did you guys, did you notice the key ring that the teacher had in the example, how he had that, that large ring with little tags on it? Oh, such a cool idea. So easy to carry around. I think those little uh, tags you can get on Amazon just for a couple bucks or like Office Depot, they're keychain tags. And it's just, it's easier than a cup of sticks. You know what I mean? You can just have it around, always with you. And just, you can put your EL's name on there two or three times. You could color code them. You can do whatever you need to do. That's pretty cool. All right, so tonight's attendance question has been posted for the last uh, couple minutes there. Out of all the topics that we've covered in this course, which was the most significant to you and why? That's what you're gonna send to me via email. Um, looking forward to hearing. I'm going to use this as kind of like a poll um, and maybe take some of those topics and go a little deeper. Um, and then ones that I don't get a lot of feedback on, I'll, I'll, I'll pull back from a little bit just so I can go deeper in what's more important and what's more useful to you all for my future classes. So, all right, does everybody have the attendance question? Okay. All right, we are almost done for the night, believe it or not. It's gonna be a quick one tonight. So next we're gonna go over some interview questions. And this is where I'm gonna want you to raise your hands. And I don't wanna hear from the same people. There's a lot of you that uh, probably have never heard your voice before. I'd like to hear from you tonight. So the first question, I'm not gonna ask you to answer this one. What the, the, the purpose of this activity is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the questions or the, or the prompts. I'm going to tell you what they're really looking for here, okay? So usually one of the first questions in an interview or first prompts is tell the panel a little bit about your educational background or yourself. Now, this is, they, they really don't want to know too much because one, you've already given them your resume and you filled out the application and you've put a ton of information on there that they already know, okay? Um, this is an opportunity, one, to help make you less nervous, okay? It's, it's kind of the icebreaker to get you talking um, before they start asking questions. And usually they don't hit you right off the bat with hard questions. They build up to that because it's, I, you know, as an interviewer, I want to see your best. And so I, I know that interviewing is a stressful um, event and a lot of people are nervous. And so our goal is to see who you are without the nerves so we can make an informed decision on who we're hiring. So don't, you know, don't spend 20 minutes telling about how um, you've always wanted to teach since you were three years old and you played teacher in, the, in your house and, and your grandma was a teacher whose grandma was a teacher. That, that's all very cool and stuff. I mean, but just a little bit about yourself. If you can sprinkle something in on how passionate you are about students and learning, that's great. That's the thing that you want to put in every one of your answers. If you're not talking about how much you love kids or if that's not coming across, um, that, that's what people are always going to be listening for. Because when you leave the room and they deliberate, the first thing you want them to say is, wow, they really love kids. Or, wow, they're going to be a great teammate or a, a breath of fresh air. or that Because that's what your interviewers are looking for, how you're going to fit on the campus. Not necessarily about the content of your answers, because we're, we're hoping that anybody apply, who applies for a teacher interview um, is going to be able to answer the questions correctly. We're looking for what you're going to bring to the site, if you're going to be a good fit on the team, and if you care about the kids in our community. So or however you can get that information in there in your answers, the better. So here you go. What are your greatest strengths as a teacher? This isn't a time to be humble. This is a time to brag. You want to sell yourself here. Talk about how classroom management or your relationship building skills, but you don't want to leave it at that. I don't want a teacher who's just a great relationship builder. You also, you know, I'm great at building relationships with students and connecting with them, but that's one of the most important things you have to do in order for them to learn. You have to Maslow before you bloom. You can even use that. Go ahead. I'm not going to copyright it because I stole it too. So, um, but yeah, that, that's the point you want to get across is that 
you're all about kids, you're all about relationships, but you're really about student achievement and learning too. What is your bigness, biggest weakness? This is a trap question. Don't go, you know, classroom management <laughs> or uh, direct instruction. You, you don't want to answer this one with, your, with the actual answer. You want to say something along the lines uh, of how your biggest weakness is actually a strength. Uh, you know, I find myself really sometimes caring too much about kids to the point where I don't take a, enough time for, for balance in my own life. And I really need to work on that. Um, or I, I plan too much. I really, you know, when I make, I write, I write a lesson, it takes me a long time to create it because I'm trying to think about everything that my students might do and I might overthink things too much. See, those aren't really weaknesses, right? Those are strengths in disguise. And so this is an opportunity for you to, to, to share your strengths in disguise, okay? Any questions so far? Get those first three out of the way. All right. How do you build relationships with students, parents, colleagues, administration? So one of you go ahead and take the first one, the students. Somebody, how would you attempt to answer that one in an interview? How do you build relationships with students? Because you're gonna get some form of this question or another. Go ahead, Cyril. Um, hello. Go ahead. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> I guess well, I'm in special needs, so probably the main, main thing I would do I would be very familiar with their gifts and IEPs and get an uh, idea of how how their parents are able to um, manage their you know, kind of fading out. Oh, sorry. Get get an idea of what their you know reinforces are their likes and. Uh, Kind of use that to build okay, good. I see Terry's comments in the chat there, letting them know that they're valued and cared for is perfect, but how, how do you do that? How do you build that relationship? Uh, Kelly, go ahead. So one thing I think that you said at the beginning of uh, our class that really has stuck with me is getting, taking the time before they even step foot in your classroom. Uh, once you get your roster, mailing them cards or making phone calls to their houses. Um, I've even seen ideas where you send like packets or like a little like flyer kind of like about you so that you can get that, let them kind of like relax and not be too nervous about school and just knowing that you're there for them and that you've thought about them and you're taking time that you don't even have to take to go out of your way and sort of meet them and welcome them before they even come to you. Big time, right? And that's not only their students, you're also making relationships with parents when you do that. Excellent. Good. Go ahead, Greg. Um, to elaborate on what uh, I believe her name is Kelly, what she said. Yeah, like you did mention to send out uh, things in the summertime. But even even more, uh, when they first see you face to face, if you don't get to see them over the summer, um, try try at least your first day, or not, if not your first couple of days, doing icebreakers to get to know them and then get to know you as well. Uh, I feel like that's very important to build a rapport outside of just the content that you're going to teach, but trying to build a, a, a relationship with them. You know, getting to know who, what what their favorite activities are, you letting them know what your favorite activities are, just little things like that. Absolutely, very good. All right, how about the second, the second part? How are you gonna build relationships with your colleagues and administration? That's an important one that a lot of people don't think about sometimes is how are you gonna build a relationship with admin? I'm not ignoring you guys. I just wanna see some other hands pop up. Come on, y'all. Don't, get, don't make me pull out my popsicle sticks. How are you gonna build relationships? This is a big one with, with your colleagues because uh, you, we, you know, as an administrator, I'm hiring a team player. I'm, I'm hiring, at least at my school, you're becoming a member of the family. And that's, that's the kind of culture we have at our school. And so are you gonna be somebody who makes our family stronger? Or are you going to be somebody that, you know, makes it weaker? And so we're looking for that. We need to know that. And if you're not going to sell yourself as one who makes it stronger, 
then we're just going to assume that it's not going to work. So you really got to sell yourself. All right, go ahead, Kelly. Um, mine is just simple. It's basically, I have a friend who um, has taught, this is her third year teaching, and she kind of doomed herself from day one because she always held herself up in her classroom during lunch breaks or any of the other times that she could have been sitting in the staff room, kind of like getting to know them and being on part of the team. Now, if she's in her third year teaching and she's finding it really hard to make relationships with people because she stayed so secluded for like the first two years on her own. Yeah. And that, that's a touchy one, right? The staff room. Because depending on the culture of the school, the staff room could be a place that you might want to avoid. Um, it, could be a neg it could be a place where teachers just crush kids. Um, absolutely. It could be a nightmare, just like you said, Terry. It, it's, I've, been in, I've seen staff rooms that are just horrible. They, they just bash kids. They bash other teachers. They bash administrators. And so that, that is not a, a collegial environment that you want to be a part of. So without, how can you build relationships with colleagues leaving the staff room out of the equation? Go ahead, Greg. I feel like um, you should, well, for a secondary position, um, middle school and high school, you should be able to collaborate with your fellow teachers that's in the math department or science department so that you guys can, you know, bounce ideas off each other, what uh, teaching things that, what, what, what you guys can do to, you know, help your students better and things that, and I feel like that's something that you could do with, uh, with your fellow colleagues. Yep, this is where you're gonna bring in the, those, those ideas like professional learning communities and collaboration that, you know, I can't, you know, I, my neighbors might know a whole lot more. They're gonna know a lot more than me about teaching. And so I wanna tap that, that resource so that I can be a better teacher. I, I, wanna, I wanna look, I wanna visit other classrooms. I wanna see what's happening. I wanna see great teaching and I wanna steal their ideas. You can say that in an interview. Uh, how about administration? How do you build relationships with administration? Oh, look at all <laughs> crickets. <laughs> oh, you're hurting this administrator's heart. No, just kidding. I know that we're on the dark side. So let me help you with this one. If you get asked this question, your administrator should be your biggest supporter on, on your campus. It, it, you're right on, Paul. Go to them for help. Don't be too proud to ask your administrator for help. It is a greater sign of weakness if you don't come to us for help and you make huge mistakes, that we're actually, we're there to help you, okay? Um, if you, I had, oh, I'd never forget, one of my teachers at my school last year was my first year at the school. And I walked in on a math lesson and she just looked at me and she goes, I'm stuck, I'm lost, can you come teach this? I'm like, yeah. And so I dropped, I stepped right up and started teaching the lesson and I modeled strategies and all these things that I wanted, you know, that I'd been talking about during our staff meetings and stuff. And that was huge for our relationship. You know, it was all about that she trusted me and that I trusted her to, to you know, to, to say that this, I was struggling because nobody's expecting perfection, right? So you, you're going to be your hardest critic on yourself, especially when you're probationary. Um, but don't be afraid to ask for help. And, and actually it, it boosts our egos a little bit when you come to us for advice and help too, because we, most of us really want to help our teachers, especially our new ones. We want you to succeed. Okay. Good, 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 good. Uh, absolutely. Good. Where do you see yourself in five years? Five years. This is, this is an interesting question because it's, it's, it wants to see that, that you have a growth mindset, right? But it's um, it's it could be a trick question too. Is are you going to be? Are you? Am I going to have a commitment from you? Are you going to be here a while? So if I invest time and resources and energy into you, am I going to get a return? And so it's kind of this is a good question that is asked to kind of see what is your vision, where do you see yourself? Are you someone who is going to grow in your profession? And am I? Are you worth the investment? So. With that kind of background knowledge, how would you answer this one?
What do you think? All right, I'm just going to call on somebody. I'm going to call on Richard. Richard, what do you think? Hello? Hello. Hello. Can you repeat your question? I'm so sorry. It's where do you see yourself in five years if you get asked that in an interview? Oh, yes, sir. Um, I'll be happy to answer that question for you. So I would see myself in five years um, teaching out of high school. Um, I live in Hemet, so Hemet Unified School District will be awesome in Riverside County. If not, um, one of my old teachers is a principal, and she will be willing to help me go in the nearby cities of Temecula or Marietta. So I'll be looking to teach physical education with the masters soon. Okay, so this is these are all teacher interview practice questions. So you're interviewing for a job at my school right now. Yes, pretend, sir. And hypothetically, and uh, we're in that. If I were to ask you, where do you see yourself? At your, let's say you're interviewing for a PE position at my school. Yes, and sir. I ask you, where do you see yourself in five years? What's your answer? I would like to say um, I see myself in your school district at one of your high school, middle school levels. Um, I would like to be a, either a football or a high school baseball coach for you guys at schools and, uh, and help these children succeed into whatever they want to do, sir. Good. See, so we have some, some – I've got an investment from Richard there. He wants to coach. That's good. How about somebody else? Good job, Richard. Thank you. Let me see. How about uh, Sally? Sally, are you there? <laughs> I'm going to call in non-volunteers. Now everybody's listening, I bet. Sally, what do you think? You're interviewing for a position at my school right now. And I just asked you, where do you see yourself in five years? Sally, go. Sorry, I was moving rooms. No worries. Um, in five years, I see myself um, It's a tough question. I just asked, answer this question at an interview in August. <laughs> I can't remember what I said. Um, in five years, I see myself with my master's um, teaching in a mild, moderate, severe classroom in the Hesperia Unified School District. Good. So what I hear is you're furthering your education. You believe in lifelong learning and that you want to stay in our school district. Correct. Excellent. That's the, those are all the things we're looking for. And Amber, I see your answer there is hopefully I'll still be at this job. Try not to say, hopefully, I'll still be in this job. I like the idea of finding new ways to reach students and taking more classes to better my own education. That's the right answer. All right, next question is, describe your classroom management system. This one's always going to be on there. Describe your classroom management system. Who's got this one? Who thinks they got this one? What do you think, Amber? You got this one? Why is it so quiet? Hello. 24 of you, I know, I know that you're not all this quiet. Come on. Anybody? Classroom management system, what would you say? <laughs> you have nothing to be nervous about right now, Kelsey. Go for it, Kimberly. Okay, so right now I'm actually, um, I have an emergency kindergarten class. And so what we do is we have a clip up, clip down chart, um, and it works pretty well for them. I have like three steps to clip down to, as well as three to clip up to. So um, if they clip up uh, for the first time at the end of the day, they get to come up in front of the classroom and um, everybody gives them a big pat on them. And then I give them like one little cookie crisp cereal because to them it's like a huge deal to have a cookie. <laughs> and then, um, for I do it's, it's a huge deal for kindergarten so then for the second one if they clip up they get a round of applause from the whole class and then I give them two cookies little cookie crisp cookies and then the third one I will um, send a message home to mom and dad telling them 
the great job and then they get um two cookies and a goldfish cracker and it's like a huge deal so that they clip down for the first one um it's just a warning and then if they clip down again they have to lose uh five minutes of their lease and then the last time if they clip down again then they get a phone call home that's negative so that is pretty much if i, my, if I um, clip down in your classroom can i clip back up yes absolutely awesome. If you're doing a good job, then I will call them, go put back up. Kimberly, that is awesome. I'm so proud that you are a 11th grade AP English teacher. Sounds perfect. <laughs> uh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Clarence, how about you? Hello? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, um, I think pretty much it would be best to talk about like, how like your uh, however your management system is 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 talk about like how it helps the students I guess like how uh, energizing your classroom is and just that, the overall feel I guess that would be good so those would be the potatoes and I I need some meat if I'm asking a specific question like describe your classroom management system I want to know exactly how you're going to manage your kids. So just like Kimberly said, I would use the clip up, clip down system. That's giving me a system, right? Sure. One th and then you can talk about, you know, I think it's important that students are respected and that I have a strong relationship with my students. And that, that's something you can sprinkle in to season your answer. Um, but really when it, they're asking a pointed question, it needs that pointed answer. Because when you, when you beat around the bush, um, what, what's interpreted at the table is that you don't have an answer to the question, even though you might. Um, I know I, my first interview as a teacher, I totally bombed it um, because I gave a lot of potatoes and not enough meat. And when I went in to meet with the principal afterwards, because I asked you, I said, after I didn't get it, I said, hey, can I come in and meet with you after school sometime and you can give me some feedback on my interview? And the guy was like, yeah, absolutely. That was huge. I nailed my next interview because he did that. Um, I think it's important here too with classroom management that you avoid the, I'm gonna send a student to the office um, because it's not that principals don't wanna support you with discipline, but the thing is, is you, what teachers need to understand as soon as you send a student out of your classroom or to somebody else to handle, you are relinquishing your power and you're relinquishing your authority. And you need that authority for as long as possible. If you have 180 days in a school year, you want to know in May that, you know what, I've had enough. I've been dealing with this all year. You're going to the office, and then the office can be the hammer, right? Okay, you're done. Um, in a PBIS system, you might have a lot of supports um, where there's other levels and, and kind of, uh, um, you know, different, what, what am I looking for? Tiers of support for, for your students. Um, yeah, so all those things. Questions on the side. Is it okay to talk about individual, small group, and whole class management systems? Absolutely, Kelly. Start with the macro, end with the micro, right? Good, 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 good. All right, next one. Why isn't my PowerPoint? Here we go. Click. What three things do you need to know about a child to have the greatest impact on them? What three things? Now see this one, this one you might surprise the panel because they're, they're asking for your opinion. There's no, there's no right answer to this. Roxanne, go for it. Go ahead. Um, I would say the things that you would probably need to know are more of their likes, things that motivate them, and things that can reinforce them when they're doing good. Okay, so how would you articulate that in a real interview? Okay, so like in a <laughs> scenario? No, yeah, you because you don't want to give me a, a fifteen second answer, right? True, true. Okay. So you've thought, <laughs> I'm just trying to help you guys out. So one thing you do in an interview is after every question, I want you to ponder it for a second. 
Okay. All right. Don't answer right away, even though you might have a great answer to it. Just ponder it. Think about it. Go, that's a really, really good question. Or I'm really glad you asked me that question. Because one that shows that you're thoughtful, one and it shows that you're not, you don't react, that you're a thinker. Um, so it's a good interview strategy, interview skill. So now thinking about that, Roxanne, you're sitting across the table. There's six of us and we're staring at you. What three things do you need to know about a child to have the greatest impact on them? Okay, the three things that I would need to know about a child would be some background information on them, some likes that they are interested in, and maybe some things that can help reinforce them when they're behaving. So what kind of background information would you look for? Um, more so maybe like um, behaviors, for instance, if the child has high behaviors, you might need to know a little bit more about them and more of like the plan for the behavior to happen, like the behavior plan. Okay. Um, what, what, how would you use their interests to support them? Why is that important? Um, the interests are important because you need to relate with your students and you need to be able to find something to relate with them. So for instance, if they like a specific characters like Paw Patrol, for instance, if you know they like Paw Patrol, you can help motivate them by having more Paw Patrol things and some like a sticker. They could work for something. Oh, you did great. Here's a Paw Patrol sticker because you know you they like that specific type of genre. Okay. So, so good. I had to pull that out of you, right? I know. That was a little, this is very nerve wracking. I don't That's like okay. it. <laughs> well, what's nice is, what's nice is there's nothing on the line tonight. I'm trying to help True. you. True. The True, more you interview like I'm this. literally interviewing for a job right now. <laughs> really nerve wracking. This is not how I expected our last night to end. That's <laughs> uh, hilarious. Um, so this is, you know, the more you interview, the better you get at it. And I mean, of course you want to land your first job, but interviewing is a skill in itself. Um, one, you, you want to go in confident. You want to go in like you have nothing to lose. You want to interview the school as much as they interview you because do you really want to work at a school that you're not going to be happy at? Absolutely not. So make sure you do your research and you ask questions, at, which we'll get to that. But um, So with yours, you, you gave three topics, right? The three things that you wanted to know about a child. You want to follow up each topic with the details. All right. It's just like a writing assignment. I want to know their interests. I need to know their interests because blah, 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 blah. I need to know some background information. I need to know background information like um, do both family, families live in the home or are they divorced parents? Because that's a child safety thing. Are there custody papers on file? Um, how many siblings have they had in the school before? Um, what are their, do they have any disabilities? Do they have an IEP? Do they, that's the kind of, so you want to follow up each of your topics with the with your key points and why okay don't an, just answer the what's answer the why's and if you can add the hows on how you would use them to have an impact on them now you're taking it to a whole nother level okay good stuff um let me see kevin go all right here's the big response that you wanted um number one the students they really want to learn and identifying the interest is important because they seek that novelty and there's always something that connects with a student. So whether it's, and, and the way that I do that is through a music or a visual and appealing to the senses that they have, the five senses. They also respond heavily to emotions, positive and negative feedback can be constructive to students. Uh, be mindful of their past experiences and communicate that through families and, and administration to understand um, where, they, where they're coming from. Um, because they really need that structure and they respond to that attention. They, they want that attention, uh, whether it's positive or negative constructive feedback, um, kids will offer you an unfiltered, um, they'll give you feedback and it's all unfiltered, unfiltered. So as soon as you say something they don't like, that facial expression will get to them and that's something that you can immediately change how you approach that child. Good. Nice. <laughs> All right, excellent. I like Cody. I like the dreams in there too. What are their dreams? How would you use that? Good. Excellent stuff. Let's go. Keep going. Um, we're running out of time because I really want to get to my last slide tonight, but we're going to hit this one. How do you use assessment data? Hopefully, you're going to answer this one by saying, I use assessment data to instruct what I'm teaching and how I'm going to teach it. 
I need to know what it's the voice of my students. And a number of my students might not have, have the voice in class to tell me how they learn best or what they need to learn. So that's how I'm going to use my assessment data. That's where you're going to talk about summative and formative assessment, how you use it, how you prefer formative assessment, all those things. Okay. Uh, what are the components of a strong lesson? I gave you this. I gave you the answer sheet to this one, right? I need uh, the standard, and then I'm going to deconstruct that standard into a teachable objective. I'm going to activate students' prior knowledge. Then I'm going to tell them why, why they need to learn this, why it's relevant. Then I'm going to model what it is that they're learning. Then I'm going to do what's called structured practice, which is perfect practice. That means I'm going to have the students walk me through each step of the, of the lesson or the problem. And then I'm going to do guided practice, which that's where I'm going to walk, the students are going to walk each other through steps one at a time. And all the while, I'm going to check for understanding to make sure that they are lockstep in sync and understanding it. At any point during this sequence, I may have to go back and reteach and do another model or structured practice problem. Eventually, I'll get to the point where I close the lesson and then we have some independent practice. Right, so strong lesson components. How do you support struggling students? English learners, gifted students, students on IEPs, you better be able to answer how you're gonna support all of those kids inside of your classroom. None of your answers should have anything to do with sending them out to get services, okay? That it's, these are your kids, and so make sure you stress that these are my kids. And here's what I'm going to do to meet all their needs during my, my lessons. What is a professional learning community and how do you fit into one? Okay. Does everybody know what a professional learning community is? Well, hopefully you've learned about that a little bit. I wish I had another week in this class to teach that. All right. This one. All right. We've got to talk. Do you have any questions for the panel? I've hired teachers just because of the questions they've asked when they asked. This is not one of those questions that we just wrap an interview up with. Okay. This is one that will show what, that you can just totally sell yourself on. One, it can show that you researched the school. You can say something like, I noticed on your website that you have a multi-tiered system of support. How do you support students' emotional needs at this school? That's a Whew, see, this is what I mean. You're interviewing them. I, I remember my last job interview for the current position I have, which is superintendent, and it was with five board members. And my interview lasted two and a half hours, and I interviewed them for almost two hours. I sat and asked questions to them for almost two hours. And that's what got me the, the job is because I'd done so much research on the district that I was asking them questions that I was prepared to say, well, here's what I would do. Well, here's what I would do. And that's so important that you ask those questions. Um, you know, how do you support STEM education at this school? And they might go, well, um, how do we really, we've started. Then you say, well, here's what I'm going to do in my classroom. So this is your chance to almost put in more information and answer questions that they didn't even ask you. Does that make sense? So you might have a wheelhouse, right? How do you integrate the arts at this school? If you haven't, if you're really strong at bring, integrating the arts and this is where you say, well, here's what I'm going to do in my classroom. How do you teach writing at the school? Is there, is there a systematic approach to teaching writing at the school? Oh, there isn't. Well, here's what I would do. So this is that opportunity where you can just crush, crush the interview, right? The last one. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in teacher interviews and I'll get, um, so are there health benefits? It's like, oh, you're, uh, that's, not, that's not happening, right? Or do you have any questions? No, I'm done because they just want to get out of there, right? Because it's nerve-wracking. You, you can absolutely bring a piece of paper, bring a notebook with you. I, definitely, thanks for bringing that up, Catherine. Bring a notebook, write things down, right, during the interview, okay? All of that is good to do. It shows that you're, you're studious, you're attentive, and that you're a listener, okay? Very good. Any questions about anything? Anything? Did this help? Did this little activity help? Good. If you get a job, let me know. 
Um, I am, I am your biggest advocate right now and I'm pulling for y'all and, uh, yeah. All right. I'm sorry if you got so nervous. I didn't mean to. That's the interview. Do any of you ever get that little rash on your neck? Oh, I always feel so bad. You should see me when I'm interviewing teachers. If I see that they're getting nervous, I totally, I'm like such a dork. I try to break the ice and make them laugh and get them so comfortable, but I don't know. I just, I just feel so bad. All right, so this last one, here we go. You're going to love this. I have spent my entire life either at the schoolhouse, on the way to the schoolhouse, (laughs) or talking about what happens in the schoolhouse. Both my parents were educators. My maternal grandparents were educators. And for the past 40 years, I've done the same thing. And so needless to say, over those years, I've had a chance to look at education reform from a lot of perspectives. Some of those reforms have been good. Some of them have been not so good. And we know why kids drop out. We know why kids don't learn. It's either poverty, low attendance, negative peer influences. We know why. But one of the things that we never discuss or we rarely discuss is the value and importance of human connection. Relationships. James Comer says that no significant learning can occur without a significant relationship. George Washington Carver says all learning is understanding relationships. Everyone in this room has been affected by a teacher or an adult. For years, I have watched people teach. I have looked at the best, and I've looked at some of the worst. A colleague said to me one time, they don't pay me to like the kids. They pay me to teach a lesson. The kids should learn it. I should teach it. They should learn it. Case closed. Well, I said to her, you know, kids don't learn from people they don't like. She said, that's just a bunch of hooey. And I said to her, well, your year is going to be long and arduous, dear. (laughs) Needless to say, it was. Some people think that you can either have it in you to build a relationship or you don't. I think Stephen Covey had the right idea. He said you ought to just throw in a few simple things, like seeking first to understand as opposed to being understood. Simple things like apologizing. You ever thought about that? Tell a kid you're sorry, they're in shock. (laughs) I taught a lesson once on ratios. I'm not real good with math, but I was working on it. (laughs) And I got back and looked at that teacher edition. I taught the whole lesson wrong. (laughs) So I came back to class the next day and I said, look guys, I need to apologize. I taught the whole lesson wrong. I'm so sorry. I said, that's okay, Ms. Pearson. You were so excited. We just let you go. (laughs) I have had classes that were so low, so academically deficient that I cried. I wondered, how am I going to take this group in nine months from where they are to where they need to be? And it was difficult. It It was awfully hard. How do I raise the self-esteem of a child and his academic achievement at the same time? One year, I came up with a bright idea. I told all my students, you were chosen to be in my class because I am the best teacher and you are the best students. They put us all together so we could show everybody else how to do it. One of the students said, really? I said, really, we have to show the other classes how to do it. So when we walk down the hall, people will notice us. So you can't make noise. You just have to strut. (laughs) And I gave them a saying to say, I am somebody. I was somebody when I came. I'll be a better somebody when I leave. I am powerful and I am strong. I deserve the education that I get here. I have things to do, people to impress and places to go. And they said, yeah. You say it long enough, it starts to be a part of you. And so, I 
I gave a quiz, 20 questions. Student missed 18. I put a plus two on his paper and a big smiley face. <laughs> he said, Miss Pearson, is this an F? I said, yes. <laughs> he said, then why'd you put a smiley face? I said, cause you on the roll. You got two right, you didn't miss them all. I said, and when we review this, won't you do better? He said, yes, ma'am, I can do better. You see, minus 18 sucks all the life out of you. Plus two said, I ain't all bad. <laughs> Four years, I watched my mother take the time at recess to review, go on home visits in the afternoon, buy combs and brushes and peanut butter and crackers to put in her desk drawer for kids that needed to eat and a washcloth and some soap for the kids who didn't smell so good. See, it's hard to teach kids who stink. <laughs> and kids can be cruel. And so she kept those things in her desk and years later, after she retired, I watched some of those same kids come through and say to her, you know, Miss Walker, you made a difference in my life. You made it work for me. You made me feel like I was somebody when I knew at the bottom I wasn't. And I want you to just see what I've become. And when my mama died two years ago at 92, there were so many former students at her funeral. It brought tears to my eyes, not because she was gone, but because she left a legacy of relationships that could never disappear. Can we stand to have more relationships? Absolutely. Will you like all your children? Of course not. <laughs> and you know your toughest kids are never absent. <laughs> never. You won't like them all, and, and, and the, the, the tough ones show up for a reason. It's the connection. It's the relationships. And while you won't like them all, the key is they can never, ever know it. So teachers become great actors and great actresses, and we come to work when we don't feel like it, and we listen to policy that doesn't make sense, and we teach anyway. We teach anyway, because that's what we do. Teaching and learning should bring joy. How powerful would our world be if we had kids who, who were not afraid to take risks, who were not afraid to think, and who had a champion? Every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists that they become the best that they can possibly be. Is this job tough? You betcha. Oh, God, you betcha. But it is not impossible. We can do this. We're educators. We're born to make a difference. Thank you so much. So with that, it saves me from trying to make a soapbox speech at the end of a term. I just want to say thank you. Do not lose my contact information. I will always be a resource for you as long as you keep my cell phone number. Um, if you feel like you just need to vent, if you have questions, anything, just reach out to me, okay? It's been a great term, everybody. Um, if you need any support, any help, you know how to reach me. And uh, yeah, good luck, everybody. Go for it, Roxanne. Can you explain that last assignment that we have due this week? The accommodations and modifications? Yes. So what you're going to do is it's in the assignments folder. You're putting five accommodations and five different modifications. Most of it's, I mean, it's pretty, don't stress over it too much. Um, you're looking for accommodations, modifications for, I think it's ELs. I'd have to look at the assignment itself. Let me, uh, let me get into Blackboard real quick. So go to the FAPE accommodations modification link uh, included. 
learn about the differences between accommodations and modifications. You're going to create a table basically, uh, one side accommodations, one side modifications. Um, using the internet, internet locate five assessment accommodations and modifications that can be made for students with special needs and then five that can be made for ELs. So you should have a, a total of 10 strategies on there and that's it. Okay, Makes thank sense? you. You're welcome. Any other questions?